I think we can start. Um, thank you everyone again for joining this last session of the first Atok Young Scientist Symposium. And today, as was already said to you, uh, we have uh, two let's say, session in this morning. The first one is a poster session that now we will uh, be having. While after a small break, we will have a roundtable discussion with uh, the four different scientists in different stages of their career. And we highly recommend uh, you to join also this session, which will be uh, very interesting in our opinion. So without any further ado, let me start the poster session. And the first speaker of today is Dr. Gilbert Grell from uh, the Institute in the Nanosciencia in Madrid. And uh, he will talk about charge migration in aminophenol following the sub femtosecond X ray pulses, influence of nuclear effects, and the X very short to short variation. So, Dr. Grell, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you very, very much. I... Okay, I hope you can see my presentation. Yes, we see it perfectly. Okay. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present here at this very nice uh, workshop in the framework of the Atocam Coast Action for Young Scientists. So I will be talking about uh, our recent efforts in the group of Professor Fernando Martin to simulate charge migration in aminophenol uh, following sub femtosecond X-ray pulses, and in particular focusing on the nuclear effects and the uh, extra shot to shot variation. So this has been carried out in the framework of the Atosecond campaign that is now running at the LCLS in Stanford, led by James Cryan. And therein, uh, the aim is to use uh, two-color soft X-ray Atosecond uh, pump probe experiments, basically to uh, study ultra-fast effects, such as uh, ultra-fast charge migration. And uh, experimentally, this is very roughly realized by uh, using the split undulator technique, where one electron bunch in the X fell is used to generate a pump pulse and then is delayed by a chicane and generates a, a, a second pulse in a second undulator and then one gets a pair of pulses from one electron bunch. And this is roughly what has been published uh, only one year ago by Duras et al. And now with these uh, very intense uh, sub femtosecond pulses, one can really do a soft X-ray pump probe experiments in the attosecond time scale. And the aim of this campaign was, first of all, to study the charge uh, migration in aminophenol using pump pulses of an energy of a roughly 260 EV and probe pulses in around 500 EV. So there is a peculiarity of the x uh, that is due to the uh, x file process, namely that each pulse in principle has a different temporal, slightly different temporal envelope as well as different phases and also slightly different pulse energies. So G this jitter or shot to shot variation uh, might have a, a, a great impact on the, on the observed um, observables. And in the study, we have been investigating in particular this influence. So, and we have been doing this uh, using, a, uh, using a fully theoretical approach and we have been looking only at the charge migration caused by the pump. For that, we assume that the pump creates a coherent superposition of uh, one whole states um, that is defined by the ionization amplitudes corresponding to a certain x pulse. And these have been evaluated using the static exchange B spline DFT method, uh, which has been introduced by, Pri by Piero de Cleva and has been used in the group of uh, Professor Martin also for almost 20 years, uh, very successfully in particular in the framework of ultra first charge migration. And what we are looking at is the created dynamic whole density that is migrating through the molecule. And I hope you can now see the movie. So when one assumes a very simple Gaussian pulse with a width of 0.85 femtoseconds, one actually sees that this dynamic <coughs> part of the whole density is really migrating on a sub femtosecond to few femtosecond time scale to the, through the aminophenol molecule. However, this is not yet the uh, what we want is because it does not yet include the true uh, X-fold pulses. And for these 
In the next step, we have included uh, real, a sample of 100 um, of these expert pulses that are shown here in light blue, and they differ, as you can see, quite a lot from the uh, Gaussian pulse and that's shown here in dark blue. And in particular, what is more important to the simulation is the spectral domain. And also in the uh, spectral domain, where, where here are shown the uh, spectra of the pulses in comparison to the cross sections of the aminophenol molecule. One can see that there's quite some, some variation. Uh, however, the cross sections are very flat in this region, so uh, the effect might be not as large as it could be. In particular, interesting is also the comparison of the shot-to-shot -shot variation effect with respect to uh, the influence of the nuclear wave function that is, of course, always present and needs to be accounted for as well. So and for that, we used a sampling approach with a sample size of uh, around 100 geometries of aminophenol that is basically plotted here. And when we take into account both effects, we get the following results. So uh, looking at the dynamic hole charge localized at uh, different parts of the molecule here in red, uh, at the OH group, group in blue, at the uh, amino group and in, C and in green, localized at the uh, C6 uh, molecular backbone. One sees, uh, when, if one only takes into account the um, extra pulses, for the equilibrium geometry, so no averaging over different geometries, one sees uh, yeah, a charge migration on or an oscillation in the dynamic hole charges, which is related to the charge migration that I've just shown you in the movie. And um, the solid curves show the average over the 100 extra pulses, whereas the dotted curves only show the average over, uh, only show the result for the Gaussian pulse. And one sees that there is in principle, no difference in character, just an amplitude reduction. However, when one now takes into account that each pulse averages over the 107 geometries in addition, um, one sees <clears throat> that now by averaging really over, over 10,000 different charge migrations for the, all pairs of pulses and geometries, that um, after an initial strong oscillation, the charge migration is damped, and uh, after three femtoseconds, uh, to more, more or less smaller oscillations. So the influence of the nuclear wave function seems to exceed uh, the influence of the expert shot to shot variation. And in fact, one quite probably can uh, average over such a sample of pulses when doing these experiments because the characteristics are not altered too much, which is good news for the experiments. So in conclusion, we see sub to second charge migration and the extra shot to shot variation does not alter its characteristics too much. But uh, the, zero point, uh, the nuclear zero point energy spread of the wave function introduces a damping after three femtoseconds. And with that, I would like to, com uh, to come to the acknowledgements. I thank uh, the group of Professor Fernando Martin and Professor, in, pro in particular, Fernando and Alicia, but also Antonia, Jesus. In Etienne, of course, Piero for providing the code, um, funding and the Atochem cost action, computer time, and our collaborators from the um, Slack National Accelerator Laboratory around James Cryant, Agostino, and in particular also Joe Hang for providing the pulses. Okay, and thank you for the attention. Thank you, Dr. Grell, for the, this nice talk. And the next one will be from Mr. Jorge Delgado also from Institute in the Nanociencia Madrid. And his talk will be about attosecond spectroscopy of monogaric molecules, XUV pump, XUV probe scheme in uh, glycine. So, Jorge, the stage is yours. Okay. Um... Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Gabriel. Um, uh, let's see. So I'm going to present you this uh, uh, paper that was published uh, recently uh, in the first part of the year, and uh, it's called the second spectroscopy of small organic molecules. And the motivation of, for this work is no other than try to study the charge migration phenomena that has been uh, pointed out in different talks during this uh, uh, week. And uh, our starting point is uh, our previous uh, atosecond uh, uh, UV pump uh, femtosecond area prof experiments in which they observe uh, 
So for the second uh, electrolyte dynamics that could be associated to a specific fermentation challenge. However, this, uh, the theory of these experiments uh, were performed um, considering fixed nuclear approximations. So uh, the question of uh, how long these coherences may survive or if we can uh, unambiguously identify them, uh, if we include nuclear movement in, in our calculations, uh, still, uh, is still open. So in order to shed some light to these, uh, to these uh, questions, we present this uh, theoretical HV pump HV probe uh, experiment in glycine in which as any pump probe scheme, uh, we have a pump pulse that ionizes the molecule, we allow it to propagate, and after a certain time delay, we probe the dynamic with the probe pulse. Um, for the uh, study of the ionization amplitude, we have uh, used the multi-reference static exchange TFT method. And then uh, to account for the uh, electronuclear dynamics, we will use the surface hopping uh, algorithm that has also been pointed out in this, uh, during this week in different talks. So we have been only able to complete the first part of the experiment uh, fully, and then the second part of the experiment uh, has been only completed in a qualitative way. This is because uh, since we want to mimic uh, the nuclear wave packet, we have to use a bigger distribution of 100 atomic configurations. That means that uh, we propagate them up to the lowest cationic state, so we have 1,000 trajectories. So if we want to probe uh, these dynamics at different time delays and consider the active aspect of the decatayon, uh, uh, we have to deal with uh, a big amount of information. So we are still living with it, but uh, we are presenting uh, just three uh, uh, selected cationic uh, trajectories for the decatayon that I think uh, we, uh, allow us uh, to understand a little bit uh, the process. So let's go with the cation uh, with the action of the poles. What we are presenting here is the ionization spectrum of glycine and uh, different eigenstates. And uh, in the subsequent uh, pictures, what we have is uh, how this uh, spectra is changing as we uh, include different uh, energy, uh, different pulses with different central frequency. So if we uh, use a pulse with a central frequency of 2 bits, what we are mainly populating are the lowest uh, cationic states. And as we increase the energy of our system, we are populating higher uh, cationic states. However, it's important to notice that uh, in the case of the 16 bit, it's more probable to, po to populate higher states of the cation than in the case of the 20 bit. Of course, when the electronic wave packet that create, they uh, give rise to a different hole densities depending on the energy of the pulse. But uh, as I said, uh, we, want to, we want to observe what happened with nuclear dynamics. So that's what, what uh, we are showing here. And, um, here we have uh, the evolution of the CN distance and the CC distance that corresponds to this, uh, this uh, part of the molecule, this part of the molecule, uh, um, for the 1000 trajectories. The color bar uh, makes reference to the initial cationic states. So what we can conclude from these two pictures is that if we start uh, at a, a high cationic state, it is more probable to observe a CN fragmentation, as we can see uh, in these lines. And if, uh, on the contrary, if we start at lower cationic uh, states uh, in the trajectory, uh, it is more probable to observe a CC fragmentation. We wanted to test if this uh, behavior uh, is still preserved if we use uh, the different pulses that we have presented. And uh, it is uh, indeed true uh, because here we can see how uh, the CN fragmentation is not favorable at all if we include a 12 pulse. Uh, by the way, uh, the darker the line, the more probable to happen. And uh, in the case of the CC uh, pond, we are populating, when we are using a 12 bit pulse, we are populating mainly low uh, uh, cationic states, so uh, it's going to be uh, more favorable this fragmentation. As we increase the energy of the system, the fragmentation of the CC is less favorable, and on the contrary, the CN fragmentation is more favorable. But it is important to re uh, remark that here, uh, with uh, a pulse of 16 EVs, we are uh, we have more probability to populate higher state of the cation, so uh, we are uh, uh, we are going to observe uh, CL fragmentation with more probability than in the case of 20 EVs uh, poles. Now, if we move to the part of the decation, uh, this uh, slide is full of information, and I don't have too much time to spare it. Uh, we just, just account uh, for the ionization of the three selected trajectories, just considering the Dyson norm. We still haven't introduced the pulse. So we, uh, in order to do a qualitative study, what we uh, consider is that for a cation trajectory that is going to end up fragmentating in the CN bond, another one that is going to end up fragmentating in the CC bond, and another one that is non-dissociative. 
So we take these three trajectories and we probe them and observe what happened with the evolution of the charge at different time delays. Uh, and we indeed can observe how uh, for high time delays uh, of probing these dynamics, uh, fragmentation is going to be uh, taking place in both cases of the trajectories in which CM fragmentates and CC fragmentates. And in the non dissociative case, uh, fragmentation is not uh, taking place at all. So uh, I know it's just a, a qualitative picture, but uh, we can conclude that the um, um, electronic dynamic triggered by the pump pulse uh, gives rise to a fragmentation, uh, to different fragmentation channels that uh, we can conclude that we can observe uh, at the end of the uh, probe uh, trajectory. So that was all. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, my supervisors and the collaborators of this work, and also the funding and the computational results. Uh, I know that maybe there are some questions, so I will be very pleased to answer them in the chat room. Thank you very much. Oops. Thank you, Mr. Rigado. Thank you for this nice presentation. And the next speaker of today is Mr. Jan Blaschko. Hopefully, I pronounced it correctly. From uh, Okay, good. <laughs> From Comenius University of Bratislava. And uh, his talk will be about the study of dissociative processes by electric impact on pyridine. So, the presentation is starting. Okay. okay. Uh, so, uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for the introduction of the topic. We can comparatively study electron-induced processes because we measure ions by quadrupole mass spectrometry and excited neutrals and excited ions by fluorescence. In the case of uh, ionization apparatus, uh, pyridine uh, vapors were introduced into the reaction chamber through the molecular beam source using a capillary to generate the effusive beam. The electrons were produced by trochoid electron monochromator. The products of this reaction were analyzed by a quadruple mass spectrometer, where they are separated based uh, on their mass to charge ratio. Ions that pass through the quadruple mass spectrometer and detected uh, by, uh, sorry for the, for the tra troubles. Uh, so I will briefly uh, talk about the apparatus. Uh, so we can compressively study electron-induced processes because we measure ions by quadruple mass spectrometry and excited neutrals and excited ions by fluorescence. I think that the, uh, the part of apparatus you hear, so I will continue to the next slide. Um, the pyridine is uh, found, for example, in a, uh, nicotine or in uh, B vitamins but it is used as a solvent or a precursor for agrochemicals in a felt tracers. Well, pyridine is part of B vitamins regarding chemical structure, and B vitamins was found at the surface on the meteorites. In the mass spectra, there are sequential dissociation of uh, carbon, hydrogen, and hydro hydrocarbon from a uh, parent of the pyridine. Now, uh, here we can see in the mass 74, there's uh, the fragment C5 and plus, and we can see that the, the carbon is uh, dissociated. This, this is the example of the fragmentation pathway. Also, there are another fragmentation pathways. The mass spectrum of pyridine is measured by multiple authors, but uh, we are first uh, who uh, measured the two times ionized fragments in the mass of 38.5 and 39.5. Uh, um, I will briefly tell about the fluorescence spectra. Uh, here we present the transitions detected in the emission spectra, uh, where we can see uh, Balmer series, uh, Douglas Herbert system, uh, Deslanders Abenzoia Abenzu system, Swan system, and uh, another transitions. Here we present a special 2D spectral map of pyridine. We are able to determine both spectra and emission cross section in the map 
uh, for the wavelength from 200 to 700 nanometers and uh, the electron energy from 0 to 100 electron volts. Um, electron induced fluorescence is a very good device for uh, photophysics, uh, astrophysics, uh, because we measure reference data for the astronomical spectroscopy. Uh, in the article by uh, Vashovich, uh, the author studies the processes of hydrogen migration during photon induced processes. In our work, the, there are electron induced fluorescence experiment, and we are probably the first to report this process as well. You can see the nitrogen is in pyridine and uh, nitrogen with uh, hydrogen, which is not present in the pyridine molecule, was detected in the spectra. Uh, we also uh, determined the, the emission cross-section of most uh, uh, products. And uh, if you are interested in, uh, in this topic, please, you can see paper contribution, and uh, thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you again, Mr. Bonashko. So with the next speaker in the meantime, which is uh, Dr. Yun Yang Ma from East China Normal University in Shanghai. And uh, his talk will be about transient valence charge localization in the strong field uh, dissociative ionization of uh, HCl molecules. So the dogma, the stage is yours for the presentation. Hello, can you hear me? I hope we'll, yes, uh, we can hear you. Okay, okay. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Okay, now we can uh, see this. Okay. okay, everything is perfect, sorry. Okay, thank you. So, hello everyone, I'm Jun Yama. First, I would like to thank the community for giving the chance to introduce our recent work on the transient wireless charge localization uh, in dissociative uh, ionization of hydrogen chloride molecule. Uh, when the hydrogen molecule is ionized by the strong laser field, the critical positive charge is shared by the H and the Cl at the short intermediate distance and it's finally localized on the H side at a long intermediate distance. So how to measure the transient localization in this process? Uh, the charge, the particle of care momentum from the surrounding field can be expressed as uh, this formula, where the charge information Z is in, and uh, this formula is governed by the momentum conservation of a molecular system. So by measuring the momentum of the fragments acquired from the laser field, the charge information of the fragments uh, is mapped on, on this process. And uh, the electron canalization has a very strong distance on the, uh, on the molecular orientation with respect to the polarization of the laser field for the heteronuclear molecule due to the asymmetrical electron distribution. So when we ask uh, what's the correlation between the uh, uh, charge localization and the uh, electron time site in this process? To answer this question, the molecular orientation and uh, the electron time site should be confirmed in the measurement. Here in our work, uh, driven by elliptically polarized uh, femtosecond the pulse, the time of the electron acquire momentum uh, approximately vertical to the uh, electric uh, laser field at the ionization instant. This is called the uh, annular streaking effect for the electron. Meanwhile, the injected uh, ionic fragments provide the molecular orientation according to the axial recoil approximation. So by measuring the electron and uh, uh, ionic fragments in constants, the molecular arm tension and the uh, electron kind of side can be determined in uh, our work. And uh, uh, our experiments were performed in coachings. Briefly, uh, as can be seen, it's uh, produced ions and the electrons are separated by an uh, electric field and uh, detected by two MCB detectors. So the three dimensional of the electrons and ionic fragments uh, can be reconstructed by the major time of flight and the positions. Uh, let me show you our results. This is uh, the uh, momentum distribution of the HIO9 uh, ionic fragments in the polarization plan. 
uh, it should be noted that uh, in uh, it should be noted that the momentum in y direction is mainly attributed to the molecular bond breaking, and uh, any shift along z direction is the signature of the uh, momentum of the fragments acquired from the surrounding field, and as I introduced before, where the charge information is encoded. So by measuring the uh, momentum angular distribution, uh, the, uh, the charge information can be uh, obtained. This is the momentum angular distribution of, uh, of the, uh, the left figure. And uh, as it can be seen, the asymmetric uh, angular distribution are observed by distinguished uh, electron tank site. For the blue case, uh, the electron is released from the positive side uh, positive Y side and uh, an offset around 90 degree are observed. Uh, for this case, as can be seen, see, when the electron is uh, released from the H side, uh, more uh, charge, positive charge are shared by the H side. So from our result, uh, the most important component is that uh, when the electron is released from the H side, uh, there is a fraction of the charge is uh, uh, localized on the H side. Well, when the electron is released from the cell set, we well, almost uh, no positive charge is shared by the H during the dissociative process. And uh, another signature is the yield around 90 degrees, higher than the minus 90 degrees, which is attributed to the symmetric uh, electro, uh, electron distribu distribution for the HCl molecule. And uh, which means that uh, the HCl molecule is um, preferred to be ionized when the uh, little field vector point from H to cell. Uh, likewise, the similar signature is uh, uh, the similar behavior observed uh, for the electron release from the minus Y site, which is uh, uh, cross check our experiment results. Uh, our experimental observations are also uh, supported by both classical and quantum simulations. So, in our world, uh, our work shows that uh, the uh, uh, I will show that the charge localization uh, uh, in molecular frame has a very strong dependence on the electron tunneling site, and our work is still on review for the physical review later. So, if you are interested in our work, and uh, I put my uh, uh, email here, and uh, thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ma, for this uh, nice presentation. And, and the next speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Rudranarayan uh, Katwa from the Indian Institute of Technology in Dambad. And his talk is about air stable and high mobility based electron transport semiconductor materials, hexachloro hexa azadrinophthaliene. So, Dr. Katwa, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, uh, my screen is visible. Yes, we can hear your presentation, but it's not in presentation mode. So, okay, okay, one minute. This is okay. This is fine. Uh, yes, that's nice, perfect. Yeah. I am Rudran Khatwa from IIDSM Dhanbad. Now I'm going to talk about air stable and high mobility based electron transfer semiconductor material. Hexachlorohexaz or tinaphthalin. Particularly in this compound, this is the star shaped compounds, and few chlorine atoms are substituted in the peripheral of the counter compounds. So this compound is uh, highly planar, and it has several auto electronic applications in display, memory, OLED, and OPV. Uh, then we go to the result of discussion section. Here, this is the structural parameters we have collected from Cambridge Special Database Center. Uh, we have calculated the uh, density, density pl plot of the HOMO and LUMO. In, in case of LUMO, it is uh, evenly distributed over the molecules. Uh, in case of HOMO, it is distributed uh, in the two wings. The electronic parameters we have also calculated, like HOMO and uh, LUMO energy. Uh, LUMO energy is around uh, the, what, 
it is around 3.63 which is very much lower and supported by local affinity value 2.6 which is satisfying the entire bond electron transport characteristics uh, then we move to the crystal structure in the particular crystal structure it is the herring bond patterns and uh, there are say, different molecules are present here in case of if you consider uh, two molecules one is center and these two are parallel uh, uh, parallel compounds uh, we can say this is the p channel we have obtained the calculate the charge transfer integral to the channel uh, similarly we have calculated from transverse channels uh, you can see here this theta theta is the angle between the parallel channel and phi the conductive channel angles uh, through which the transport is occurs uh, these are channels uh, p2 channels the intermolecular distance are very much lawyers we can say the maximum uh, couplings are opposed to the channel which is around 80 to 86.6 uh, on other channels like p t1 and uh, p t1 and t3 channels we have obtained little bit lower uh, electron coupling uh, energy then we calculate the anisotropic mobility by using these relations uh, from anisotropic mobility we have obtained the mobility electron mobility around 3.543 which is much more higher as compared to the whole uh, mobility uh, this is the mobility diagram you can see here this is the concentric circles and the larger mobility are obtained around 3.543 as compared to the whole mobility then we go to the history surface analysis history surface analysis are depicting the inter, uh, inter, inter layer interaction we have uh, different atoms we calculate the interaction among the different atoms due to the different contacts uh, you can see here uh, the chlorine and nitrogen interactions are very much higher uh, and chlorine and hydrogen atoms interaction are also very much higher we can say this is the principal interaction as compared to the other con contacts then we move to the band structure and density uh, band structure sorry density of state and band structure analysis the density of state number of states are available in which electrons are occupied these are close to the formula level. then band gap we are obtained around 1.9 several uh, bands are often to, to, to the, close to the formula level. Then we made the conclusion. In our conclusion section, in HH ATN compounds are investigated in framework for density functional theory. Mobility, high mobility are often 3.543 as compared to the whole uh, mobility 0 0.014, indicating the electron transport characteristics. Along with it, it is supported by electron affinity value, which is high, very much higher 2.6 and low, low luma energy value 3.63. Uh, then history surface analysis repeating the surface size analysis in the intermolecular layer of the crystals. The principal interactions are due to the chlorine and hydrogen interaction and chlorine and chlorine interactions. And several minor interactions are there like chlorine, nitrogen, nitrogen, nitrogen and oh, oh, sorry, carbon, carbon interaction. Uh, these are the references. I am very much thankful to IDS and Dhanbad for providing the research support. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind attention. We'll more discuss about in the breakout room. Thank you, Dr. Prato. And the next uh, speaker is Mr. Radgan Sunya uh, from uh, Universidad Autónoma de Madrid. And uh, his talk will be about molecular photoionization time delays. Hello, can hey. you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. We can see the presentation. Okay, perfect. So, uh, good morning. I'm Adrián Jesús Uñar Rubio, uh, a first year PhD student from the Autonomous University of Madrid um, at the group of Fernando Martín. And today I'm going to present uh, with a short presentation on molecular photo ionization time delays. The concept of photoionization time delays uh, has arisen since the discovery of the photoelectric effect. In fact, uh, when matter is generated with light, one can question if the electron is ejected instantaneously or there is a time during which the electron wave packet needs to be formed. Actually, Bigner laid the foundations of this concept in 1955. He defined it as the derivative of the scattering phase with respect to the electron energy. In other words, it can be understood as how much delays uh, electron phase in a short range potential with respect to a free electron. However, this quantity cannot be retrieved from, from an experiment. That's why different strategies have been proposed to access it. Among them, one that has provided success, successful results is a so-called um, streaking technique. 
Sato second electron streaking is a prompt proof technique in which a nanosecond X UV pulse ejects the electron to the continuum, and then a few femtosecond IR pulse uh, streaks or modifies the momentum of the electron in the continuum. Uh, the accumulated momentum by the interaction of the IR field gives you information of the time delay through this formula. Our aim is to study the concept of photoionization time delays in molecules in full dimensionality. This means by taking into account both the electronic and nuclear parts. Until now, there are no detailed theoretical studies that explore this concept in full dimensionality. So the only reasonable approach is to start with the simplest molecule, H2 plus molecular ion. For that, we have focused this study in two different frameworks. The first one is the fixed nuclear approximation in which uh, we, which has been used in all the previous studies. Uh, and since the nuclei remain frozen here, just the electronic Hamiltonian is solved. The other framework is the full dimensional one in which uh, since the nuclear part is taken into account, both the electronic and nuclear Hamiltonians are computed. Also in the resolution of the TDSC, an appinitious spectral method is chosen. This means that the total wave function is expanded in the eigenstates of the system. In the left side of the slide, I present three sticking spectra at uh, different XUV pulses energies. So due to we are in the fixed nuclear approximation, when a pulse ionizes a system, the only energy taken into account is the electron kinetic energy, since the nuclei remain frozen, as it is schematized here in the, in the potential energy curves of the H2+. Plus. Uh, returning to the sticking spectra, we can see that uh, in the Y axis uh, is represented the electron momentum, which is the analogous of the electron energy, and the X axis, the time delay between pump um, uh, probe pulses. Comparing those figures, we see that when we increase the photon energy, also the electron momentum increase. But when we also increase the photon energy, the ionization probability decreases. This last is due to the fact that uh, a fast decay of the photo ionization cross section as the photon energy increases. Then if we fit this, uh, this spectra with the already shown formula, one can obtain these streaking time delays. Now returning to the beginner time delays, here I show this quantity in both frameworks. For the fixed nuclear approximation, we can extract them as a function of the different internuclear distance and electron energies. On the other hand, for the full dimensional framework, since the nuclear part is taken into account, the beginner time delays are going to depend on the nuclear kinetic energy, but not on the internuclear distance. Um, now, comparing these two figures, one can see that uh, there is an almost one-to-one -one correspondence between both um, figures. This means that the reflection approximation works quite well here. This can be depicted in the, this lower center plot here. Uh, summarizing the most important conclusion comes from the big NER 10 delays shown now. And it's that in an eventual experiment, the use of coincident measurements, one could find a correspondence of delays for specific nuclear kinetic energies and nuclear geometries. Here, finally, I show the people in the, of the group involved in this project. And thank you so much. And I'm, I am happy to see you in the breakout room for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Sunyar. And the next speaker is uh, Mattia, uh, Mr. Matthias Bertolino from Lund University in Sweden. Yes. And uh, his talk would be about multiphoto interaction phase shifts in atom second science. Thank you, Gabriele. Okay. I hope you can see it. Yes, we can see it perfectly. Thank you for the introduction. So my name is Matthias Bertolino. I'm a PhD student in Jan Marcus Dahlstrom's group at the university. I would like to thank you for this inspiring week. And uh, today I'm going to talk to you about interaction phase shifts. And I want to do it by presenting a neat rule of thumb that is powerful enough to explain some general phase and amplitude patterns in a range of at the second and free electron laser interferometry experiments. In particular, I want to talk to you about minus i. 
And I want to do it by counting the number of interactions between light and matter. But I am, of course, not the first one to talk about phase shifts through interaction. It's known from perturbation theory that you acquire a minus i for each new order, and some time has already passed since Feynman started to count these vertices. But I believe that these minus i have somehow been overlooked, and I believe it is due to the success of rabbit, because in rabbit, both the interferometric pathways share the same number of interactions with the probe field. But this is, of course, not the general case, and in particular, not for some of the more recent experiments. And I want to give you a brief presentation of some of the results we've acquired in our latest research. So as a starting point, we had developed this new ab initio method, which we wanted to try. And we studied this experiment by uh, Laurent et al, where they performed uh, laser-assisted photonization with odd and even harmonics generated from omega and to omega high order harmonic generation. So in this experiment, you see the photoelectron spectrum and with a varying CEP or delay between um, the IR and the odd and even harmonic comp. What they saw was they saw this alternating pattern between the peaks corresponding to odd and even harmonics. They call this a checkerboard pattern. And their explanation to this with their model was that in order to achieve this checkerboard pattern, they must have a minus pi over two between odd and even harmonics generated this way. We reached the same conclusion. We can agree upon that, that in order to reach this alternating pattern you see here, there must be a minus pi over two. But when we started looking at this, they also said that they expect a rabbit modulation, namely a modulation over a period of pi. But we couldn't see this. We could only see this of two pi. So we turned to this rule of thumb derived from the strong field approximation in which we find that for each new interaction with the probe field, we acquire a minus i, which gives a phase shift of pi over two or minus pi over two. And as you can see here, for reaching this band here, corresponding to say an even uh, harmonic, you can either go directly or you can uh, emit one or two or absorb one of two IR photons. And you can see that the odd and even um, pathways they did not share the same number of interactions. And in particular, what would give a rabbit modulation would have been to emit one IR and absorb one IR. But this is perfectly canceled by these other three ways, either by direct photonization or by absorption of two IR photons or emission by two IR photons. And this can ex be explained simply by this rule of thumb and that the, the different pathways acquire a different number of minus i's. Another quite interesting experiment, and this will be the last experiment I will present to you in this very brief presentation, is this experiment performed by Zipital, also from some time ago. And here they do a, you could say a rabbit-like experiment, but instead of using a combo of odd and even harmonics, uh, combo of harmonics, they're doing ATI. So they do this ATI by two omega with a two omega field, and then they probe it with a half frequency field, so an omega field. So they reach these so-called so main bands and these side bands by, um, by absorption or emission by, by one IR photon. Now, when we did this experiment, we saw something interesting, that these slopes, they are not centered about zero, like for rabbit, but instead they are centered about 45 and 135 degrees, or pi over four shift uh, relative to rabbit. And in order to explain this, we again turn to this rule of thumb that we have devised. And we saw that, aha, for the upper pathways, there is a, another interaction. So to reach this sideband, the two pathways, they do not share the same number of interactions like in rabbit, but the upper one, it has another minus i acquired to it. And if you incorporate this, you will get the phase shift of, of uh, pi over four. So with this, with these two small results, I want to thank you for your attention. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rector, for this very interesting talk. And the next speaker is uh, Mr. Martin Bravier from the University of Liege in Belgium. 
and his talk will be about, will be about the electronic coherences steer the strong isotope effect in the ultrafast Jan Teller structural rearrangement of methane cation upon tunnel ionization. A very long title. <laughs> so the stage is yours, Martin. Thank you very much, Gabriele. Uh, can you hear me? Can you see, yes. see the presentation? Okay, great. The presentation, we cannot see it. We can just uh, see oh, the yeah. camera. Can you? Okay. Now it should be better. Uh, yes, we can see it, but it's not in presentation mode. Okay, now it's perfect. It's good. Okay. Well, uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, many thanks to the organizer for this great seminar. Today, I will discuss uh, electronic coherences uh, and how they steer the strong isotope effect in uh, the ultrafast Jan Teller structural rearrangement of the methane cation upon tunnel ionization. Well, that is a mouthful. Um, so this is a picture of the potential energy surfaces uh, of our system, which uh, encompasses three electronic states, D0, D1, and D2. And as you can see, all these electronic states are degenerate at the TD geometry. And so they all uh, are involved in the ultrafast, uh, well, in the gentler uh, rearrangement. And those electronic states are expressed on a grid of nuclear coordinates, uh, which have been explained by Professor Remacle on uh, in a presentation on Tuesday, I think. Um, for our simulations, um, we had to have <coughs> to get the initial amplitudes of uh, the states uh, given by a tunneling ionization, and we obtained those using the following formula which uh, encompasses, as you can see, the population of uh, the population on the grand state of the neutral um, molecule with uh, the norm of the Dyson orbital, which gives uh, the uh, density of the ionized electron. And uh, here, an exponential factor K, which gives the probability of tunneling at a given uh, grid point in our coordinate system. And, um, for a given field strength. And you can see here um, the localization of the, those initial states on our grid for the three electronic states for two uh, different values or strength of the electric field. And in the case of the strong field, we have an electric field which um, is uh, of the order of those used in a high harmonic spectroscopy experiment. And you can see uh, here that we have a significant portion of the population which is localized in the D1 and especially in the D2 state uh, in the case of the strong field, but not in the case of a weak field. And finally, uh, we are using this uh, vibronic Hamiltonian to propagate our simulation and it encompasses the non-adiabatic couplings which will prove really quite important. So for the results, well, the, for the results here, we uh, focused on the first two uh, femtoseconds of the dynamics, which is the time scale we can access uh, through HHS. And the first result concerns uh, both populations and the coherences. Um, and you can see in the case of the strong field that uh, the population is not really affected by the isotope effect. They are quite similar in both cases. But the coherences are much more sensitive, and you can see that they decay faster in the case of CH4 plus than in the case of CD4 plus. And so the coherences are more sensitive to this isotope effect. But the main result of um, we had uh, concerns the ratio of the autocorrelation, autocorrelation functions. So the autocorrelation function is a measure of the overlap of the density matrix at uh, the, of the initial density matrix and the density, density matrix at a given time. And Lane has shown that it is, uh, this ratio is proportional to the ratio in harmonics that you can measure in an HHS experiment. Uh, we, as you can see here uh, on our graphs, in the case of the strong field, we see that we have a ratio, rather a large ratio so a rather large isotope effect on the uh, autocorrelation functions, which is not observed if we remove uh, the currencies involving the D2 state. So if we remove in a way the populations in the D2 state, 
or uh, we cannot see it if we if we use the weak field or if we remove the NAC couplings. And this is uh, uh, coherent with uh, experimental results um, reported by Baker et al. in uh, the science article. And finally, we can take a look at the localization of coherences both in uh, momentum space here, uh, both in position space or in momentum space here. And you can see that we some uh, features that we saw earlier, namely that the coherences move faster in CH4 plus than in CD4 plus, and that uh, the coherences they tend to develop patterns due to the neck coupling before the nuclei even start to move. So in conclusion, we see that uh, tunnel ionization leads to a current superposition of electric states in the methane cation. Uh, we see that the isotope effect results from both the NAC and the electronic coherences, so it's an inherently non-classical effect. Uh, we saw that the population in D2 and thus the field strength affects the isotope effect. We saw that the coherences involving D2 are uh, really quite instrumental for the isotope effect that we observed. And finally, the electronic coherences move before the nuclei do, which suggests the existence of purely electronic time scale due to NAC. Thank you all for your attention. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the break room. Thank you, Mr. Rolvier. Please, I would like to open the breakout rooms for uh, discussion. I remember you all that uh, uh, the round table will start at 10 past 11. So in principle, before this, we will have 20 minutes of coffee break, but still breakout room will be open up until the start of the um, round table in order for you to have time to discuss uh, with uh, as much people as you want. So uh, now breakout rooms are open, so I encourage you to join them. And thank you again for joining this last poster session and uh, have a nice discussion. Okay, so the poster session is finished. So I think that we, we can start. So uh, welcome everyone and good morning um, for this last session of the Young Scientist Symposium. Uh, for the, those that did not attend the afternoon session yesterday, my name is Vaisa Wani. I'm a scientist in the Atosiban Science Group at DAISY Hamburg and uh, co-organizers uh, of this event. Uh, I will be the moderator for, for today's roundtable. Uh, with this roundtable, we, we intend to create a more uh, relaxed uh, and less formal environment in which uh, we will have uh, well-established scientists in Nutrafas and Atosagan Science that can share um, some of their experiences and opinions on a few uh, topics that we judge that uh, would be relevant to guide uh, young researchers. And uh, the concept will be as follow. Uh, first, the three speakers will uh, exchange on a few topics or problematics that young scientists uh, are likely to encounter in the near future in their career. Uh, we will try to have a second period where participants can uh, contribute to the discussion and ask some questions. And finally, uh, the, the speakers will uh, discuss about their perspectives uh, for the future of uh, the top of science and provide uh, their uh, take home message for uh, young researchers. Uh, at any time during the discussion, uh, please, uh, you can raise your hand. And if the, the situation allows, uh, I will uh, allow you to ask a question or comment on the uh, actual topic. So without further delay, uh, I'm happy now to introduce the three speakers uh, for today. Uh, the first participant is uh, Alicia Palacios. Um, if your camera is not on, you can switch it on uh, now. Um, Alicia Palacios obtained a PhD in theoretical and computational chemistry uh, from the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid in 2006. Uh, from 2006 to 2009, she obtained a postdoctoral fellowship to join the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab in the United States. And from 2009 to 2012, sorry, she received another fellowship as a postdoctoral researcher to work at the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid. Uh, she obtained an assistant professor position at the same institution in 2012 and is now full professor since 2020. Since 2018, she is vice chair of the Atomic, Molecular and Optical Physics Division of the European Physical Society and obtained a number of prizes, including the Mildred Dessel House Junior Awards from the University of Hamburg in 2018. 
The second speaker will be uh, Matteo Lucchini from uh, the Politecnico di Milano, Italy. Uh, Matteo obtained his PhD from the Politecnico di Milano in 2012 with a thesis titled uh, Generation, Generation and Characterization of the Threshold Process in the Extended Ultraviolet, um, treating on application of atosegon and pentosegon pump probe techniques for atom and molecules. From 2012 to 2017, he worked as a postdoctoral researcher in the Atosegon Science Group of Professor Ursula Keller. And since 2017, he is assistant professor in physics uh, at the physics department of the Politecnico di Milano. Uh, he has more than 100 publications and has received uh, several awards for his contribution to the field of ultraviolet science. Uh, and notably, uh, he has been the winner of the Fernet Prize for an outstanding contribution in the field of atosegon science from the Europe European Physical Society. Uh, in 2019, he obtained an ERC starting grant for the investigation of atosegon dynamics in advanced materials. Last but not least, the third speaker for the round table will be uh, Piero De Cleva. Uh, Piero is at the IOMCNR and DSCF at the University of Trieste, where he became a lecturer in theoretical chemistry in 1976 uh, and associate professor of quantum chemistry from 1982 to 1994. He is since then a full professor of chemical physics, uh, author than more than 300 research papers. Uh, his research, research covers notably the theoretical description of many body effects and electron, sections, uh, electron cross sections in molecular photoionization, with many collaborations with uh, leading experimental groups. So, welcome to the three of you. And uh, I will now start with a first question for the roundtable, uh, which is the following um, How does international experience benefits to advance a career? Or in other words, uh, what are your personal experiences um, on the international point of view or, and how did it, they affect your career? I would give uh, the parallel first to um, Alicia. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, okay, to the question is that, uh, uh, first of all, uh, in my opinion, international experience is crucial for any development of a career, not only in, in academia, but also in, in industry. I mean, for, for several reasons. I mean, anyone uh, working in the area of research technology is gonna profit of that at different levels. Uh, just to kind of summarize the, the, the levels I have in mind. In the first place, uh, the obvious, to acquire new, new knowledge, uh, to learn new techniques, uh, to see how other team uh, dynamics and groups work, to develop networking. I mean, it's very important in any in, in our world to be updated on what is being done. I mean, not only in academia reading papers, what the others are doing when they are done, but really being aware on the progress to be to, to really be able to, to contribute. On the second level, I would say to have a perspective, uh, not only let's say in the scientific, more scientific aspects or 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 in the industry in the technological aspect, etc., but also from the administrative point of view, in the sense that. Uh, we all have the tendency to, to give by granted that the system that uh, we know is uh, how it usually works. <laughs> yes. It's very good to know. <laughs> in other institutions and in other countries, there are different criteria for funding, for promotion, for uh, developments, for mobility. And, and this is very useful to know it uh, from, from inside. So, so being merged and engaged in different institutions or in different countries uh, gives you this perspective, which is very, uh, very interesting to know what is inher uh, inherent to, to an academic uh, uh, career and which aspects are actually uh, can be different and can be different tackled. And, and I think this is very, uh, it's rich. And I'm finished here, but the, but the last point, and I think the most important indeed, is that the international experience always comes with personal growth. I mean, uh, it makes you, it takes you out of your comfort zone, the first place. So you have to learn new habits. You have to learn, uh, it makes you reevaluate your beliefs, uh, the type of things that you think culturally acceptable. And uh, not only that, it, it really strengthens your capability of having initiative, of being creative, or of react. And I think that this is really necessarily not only for your career, but, but for your personal developments to learn new social skills, it really forces you to that. So it gives you kind of self-awareness, self-knowledge. And, and, and I think these are the three main aspects that they will, or, or I mean, my personal experience, that they are very important that, that you can gain. Mm -hmm. 
And I briefly mentioned it in your biography, but I think your first international experience was to cross the Atlantic to go to the, the US. Uh, mm -hmm. How was it for you, uh, this change of culture? Um, well, I mean, I, I have to, the first thing I had is a lot of stress. I mean, I, I mean, because this is important to to realize that I mean, moving to a new country with a new language in a new, being uh, really alone and and a few thousand kilometers away from anything known for you, is, it really creates a stress. And you have to to that helps. At least for me, it helped me to know my own limits as a person, mm -hmm. as, as a, how I can develop, how much I do need to rely on other people or or in the structure that I I, I was kind of on the net that you have when you're in a place. So, but I mean, uh, once you cross this stress and you deal uh, properly with your limits of saying, okay, I'm gonna move, I'm gonna step, uh, start working. Uh, it was very, 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 how to say, it's very enrichful for my life. I met, I, I, not only in the career, I met amazing scientists. I learned new dynamics within a group. Uh, a totally different way of, of approaching the problems in, in the office, approaching the problem scientifically, uh, the discussions, there was a different way of doing it. As I said, from the administrative side, I really learned that there are really different criteria to, uh, to evaluate things. And that really helps also for the future, you know, when you have to, to think on how to get funding and, and so on and so on. And, and it really kind of almost very naturally uh, uh, you create a network, not only a, a professional network, but also a personal network that extended over the years. And I have, I have to say, I have many uh, good friends in within academia and outside academia that, uh, let's say, the origin of this relation came, came from there. So my experience was uh, absolutely positive in, in, every, in every possible way. So that's why I fully uh, recommend it, um, no doubt. Thanks. We can ask Matteo now to... Give you opinion about it. Yeah, I think there is not that much to add. Actually, Aditya already nicely explained everything. For sure, I mean, every every time you 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 see something new, you, you move, uh, you challenge yourself, you learn something more, and you grow. Yeah. Of course, maybe what so I fully buy everything that she said, and I agree completely. Maybe one thing I can add that has not been said already is. Um, also, if people then have to evaluate your CV, if they so if they see that you you did something outside your comfort zone or your professor, your your supervisor, then it is a plus. Or for example, if you want to apply for an ESC starting grant, uh, you you need to have at least one paper without your PhD supervisor. So if you move away, it's easier to do that. Another thing is, it's an opportunity to learn something new and combine it with what you know already uh, to, to create something unique and make yourself unique. So what <clears throat> good advice I had when I, when I had to start the postdoc, then I didn't really follow it, but almost, was to move to a group. If you have to move or if you want to move, move to a, to a group where you can uh, learn a new technique that might be combined with what you learned during your PhD because then you have an opportunity to start maybe a new field of research. Mm -hmm. So for this, you, you cannot do if you stay, if you stay still. That's clear. So it, I would say if it's possible to do it because not everybody can do it, there are many, many different things that can uh, stop you, prevent you to, to go abroad. But if it's possible to do it, if you can do it, I think everybody should do it. Thanks. Uh, maybe I give the power to Piero and then we can. Uh... <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, say, uh, I'm an old guy, uh, actually, uh, I'm presently retired. <laughs> uh, uh, well, I started, uh, uh, say, uh, quite uh, long ago, uh, say that uh, uh, I, I started the research basically in the early 70s uh, i finished uh, my degree in uh, in 73 uh, at the time uh, it was uh, uh, not uh, very uh, common in italy to move actually <laughs> my advisor uh, who was a very nice uh, person but uh, say a bit conservative advised me against <laughs> 
<laughs> gone um, because uh, say opportunity then to uh, come back uh, would uh, evaporate anyway i spent uh, a, say a couple of periods uh, abroad and uh, uh, those uh, were uh, uh, quite interesting i i think uh, that uh, um, okay there are the, the personal aspects. Uh, I personally uh, say uh, there was some suffering, <laughs> as Alicia also uh, mentioned, because uh, everything is different from your comfort zone and so on. Uh, however, um, I, I think uh, uh, the most important uh, thing is uh, what uh, uh, I, I'm thinking mainly scientifically was uh, what uh, Matteo uh, uh, pointed out, uh, say, um, I, I think you should uh, more or less uh, uh, develop uh, your field uh, uh, that uh, you, uh, you believe, uh, you like, and you will interested in. And uh, then, of course, uh, uh, ideally, you look uh, to places uh, where uh, uh, something, uh, say, uh, that can link uh, and uh, um, expand uh, your knowledge and capabilities. For instance, as he mentioned, uh, develop a new technique which uh, fits uh, with, uh, uh, with yours. Uh, just, uh, for instance, uh, uh, now it's uh, too late <laughs> for me. But uh, one uh, uh, thing that uh, uh, I think is uh, uh, the, the maybe uh, one of the most important uh, topics in uh, the theoretical framework we are interested is uh, joining the electronic part uh, to the uh, nuclear motion part. Uh, I developed my career all in the electronic path uh, and uh, it's uh, not at all uh, obvious we had a lot uh, of approaches but i think uh, this is uh, just uh, at uh, the beginning uh, we have to learn more so uh, the message uh, reinforces what uh, has been uh, said uh, develop uh, an expertise, then look around uh, how you can uh, get uh, uh, a complementary thing that fits uh, yours and uh, you will grow uh, much faster because uh, just the learning from the papers <laughs> is <laughs> much slower than working uh, in a place. Thanks. And I think also on the um, well, human point of view, human experience, uh, working in this field uh, requires collaborations and often groups are uh, multicultural. Um, so the fact to go abroad or to meet different cultures also helps you to, to understand how a certain person can react or can um, basically approach problems uh, and learn how they, they behave and avoid sometimes misunderstanding that actually do not really exist, but are just different uh, in culture. So I think this is a very important point as well uh, that is uh, that one can gain by going abroad. Uh, yeah. If I may point something, it, uh, within international experience, of course, is the, the mobility, let's say moving to new places and so on. But uh, for instance, Piero is a very good example of uh, what well, he said that in all times he was not moving. Mm -hmm. But that guy you have there, uh, he has the most, I don't know how many international collaborations Pierre is doing. <laughs> and I, because he did exactly what he said. I mean, like he really, uh, in my opinion, this is my perspective. I, I had the, the great fortune of, of collaborating with him and other scientists like him that uh, develop a solid methodology, a solid uh, work by, by their own, in their own group and so on. And then they open to collaborations, to, to, to merge with many different people. I mean, uh, 
for instance, it's a good example. Piero's work nowadays it, it is useful for people uh, introducing nuclear motion into molecules, or people uh, looking at chirality into molecules, or people looking at uh, uh, different experiments with pulses, pump probes, X-ray, and 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 I think this is this is international experience also. Let's say that I am in a place, but I'm also capable of really keep collaborations, active collaborations, and moving with all over the with people with groups from all over the world. I mean, I, I don't need to spend my life outside to be working all my life with people ab abroad, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and, and this is a second aspect that is important uh, in international experience. So, and, uh, even if you are settled at some point in, in a specific country or institution, uh, keep yourself all the doors open to, to keep collaborating because this is what really makes science advance. And nowadays, it went even more than a few decades ago. Nowadays, it's impossible to be competitive or to, to really progress, not, not even competitive, simply progress on your work uh, by yourself. I mean, because things run so fast and grow so fast that you really need this outgoing or, or like this cost action, like, like really meetings, networking, to really keep this work. Uh, sorry, you know, if, I, if I used to as an example, <laughs> but you were a good example. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, also it's it's a great fun, no, to to meet people and exchange ideas. Uh, each one brings uh, his own. Uh, uh, so I think it's very important uh, as one starts, uh, then develop, uh, a, say, a real expertise, uh, some a bit deeper, no, than the superficial knowledge. And then you share with uh, with others, and uh, and uh, get a lot uh, <laughs> in return. No, uh, each one uh, brings uh, a specific uh, expertise, and uh, you can do complex, uh, say, um, approach uh, complex problem that uh, by yourself you couldn't afford. Um, I don't know if anyone from the audience would like to, to add or comment on this point before we move to the second topic. If so, please raise your hand in the next five seconds. Okay, I don't see any comments, so I will go with the, the second questions. Um, the, the question is, uh, how important is funding? Uh, well, we, we know that it's extremely important. The question is more um, how to obtain it, uh, what are the resources, and in, in your experience, what would be uh, your advices to, to obtain such fundings and, uh, and so on? Um, yeah, I will not go speaker by speaker, but I think this, on this point, it's possible to discuss uh, yeah, among each other. If Alicia wants to start, um, I, I know that you had a couple of slides on the topic. Okay. Okay, yeah, I, I, I mean, it's not, I mean, let's say the, the, the slide itself is not that it has a lot of content. Mm -hmm. It was just kind of to help me guide a few things uh, that I think are important. First of all, funding is not only money. Funding is also uh, when you move to a place, if you have a team there that is uh, operative and is working and is well, well matched and, and it's gonna, you can incorporate exactly what Mateo said. If you want to incorporate in a place where you're gonna do something new, but you can talk to people and you can share information and you can learn from others and, and they can learn from you. So this is also funding, it's a, where I'm going to. I mean, where I'm going is their personal there. Of course, also funding, uh, you need funding not only as uh, for your own salary and so on, also for traveling and, and be able to move around. Mm -hmm. uh, funding is also the facilities. Where are, you, where are the facilities that are at your disposal? Computational resources. I mean, sometimes projects on computational time are more valuable than money itself to be able to run your codes or if you are an experimental, if the lab is there, if you have the thing. So let's say, uh, when you think of uh, when, when someone or Alice, I would recommend that when, when, when you go to a place or, or you are proposing new projects or whatever and it comes to funding, take into account these pieces. I mean, funding, it, does, it doesn't only come as, a, as money. It comes in many other forms that mm -hmm. may be more important than money itself. Okay, and then in order to apply, I would say, look, uh, I have kind of the, uh, from outside to inside. I mean, I'm, I'm gonna focus, let's say in Europe, since uh, this is a European network. Yes. Uh, yes. There's a lot of European funding. 
There are many that comes as a form of networking. Cost actions like these ones that you're here, you know, Eranet, uh, ITNs, which is in, uh, international training networks that helps you to form people, their schools. Uh, that, of course, the program, the ERC program, where you have a starting grants. This I leave to Mateo fully. Uh, <laughs> I, I applied for them, I, but I didn't get them. So probably Mateo has a better perspective. He applied and he got it. So I'm going to leave you to Mateo. <laughs> just, just luck. <laughs> okay. It's just okay. luck. Then there are the Marie Curie Cur Cur programs, where they are, uh, there, for instance, you have uh, applications for, for, let's say, for your own salary, like you can apply for, for getting a, a, a grant that or a fellowship that you can move you with your fellowship wherever you want. And they're also within the program kind of uh, funding for, for, for uh, funding itself for a project to develop your career. For instance, this is one that I actually got, this a reintegration grant. When I came from USA, uh, there are some, some different uh, sub programs uh, for specifics, like people that move in Europe uh, for two years abroad. And, and all of these uh, things, most of them, they have this requirement, as Mateo said, of mobility. I mean, it's really, it's not only I encourage you to move. It's like in these programs, if you want the money, I hope you moved. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, it's, <laughs> that is not there. Of course, look at the national agencies, uh, ministry. The, this, almost every country have their own agency or ministry, annual calls uh, for funding at itself, but also as a, a way of grants, for instance, in Spain, there's a program that is called the Ramon y Cajal program. That is really a program that comes out every year where you can apply. It's five years, it's kind of a kind of tenure tracks. And these are open to everyone. I mean, many countries have this. In Germany also have this kind for fellowship like Humboldt and so on. So I, I will say, of course, in order to know the details of these things, I will say uh, the approach if you are young is first decide what you like to do. Decide what are the topics you want to really investigate. Decide what you really are has some passion or motivation. Then identify where, which facilities, institutions, people, groups are developing them, and then contact them. Because this they will know better which kind of funding are available, if you can have a position or not. I mean, it's like contacting people is the best way to really learn. And then not only at the national level, but regional level, I mean, uh, also like in Spain or in France, there are many uh, grants that are regional. And again, this, can, this is the kind of information that you have to ask close to the people. I mean, it's very difficult to find it kind of running into the web and trying to find it. And also in institutions, this is also important because when you get to a position, whatever is postdoctoral or post postdoctoral or, or final positions or professors, uh, there are many institutions that offer possibilities such as uh, personnel attached to the position or some funding or facilities attached to the position. And this is also important to take into account. So thinking of young people, I would say, if you really are finishing your PhD and you're thinking, what do I do next? I would say, identify your interests. Maybe they change later. Maybe, I mean, keep an open mind and, and try to start contact the, the people that you think are, are really worldwide experts on these fields. And then start asking, what are the chances? I and mean, then I, I will say this as the first one. So this is kind of my general approach to funding. And okay, I just leave the word to Mateo or Piero if they want to add uh, anything. I... Actually, uh, if we can, Piero, can I? Sorry? C can, I, can I say one word? Yeah, sure. Well, thanks. Um, so what I have to say, Related to my personal experience from from Politengo when I was PhD and you know you don't think that much about funding then I moved to to ETH which is a bit wonderland and on top of it I, I went I went into the, the group of Professor Uswakelle who is also very very good at collecting pounds so I didn't in five years of postdoc I really didn't have the need for asking for new fundings. Um, and I realized only towards the end that this is not the way you should do it. So even if you, you go to the place where you can actually do what you like to do um, and you are talking with, uh, you're working with world experts and doing the job you are supposed to do. Anyway, I think it's a good practice to force yourself to try to apply for found already at the early stage after your, your PhD. Because you need to have certain expertise, you need to build it up if you want to be able to, to be successful. 
and because the, the more you get, the more you will get in a certain sense. For example, for, for the European uh, grants that Alicia was, was talking about before, um, there you have explicitly to fill in a table where you write all the funds that you already got and the ones that are running at the moment. And if your table is empty, doesn't really look good for the reviewers. So uh, it's better to start to collect even something small, in my opinion, uh, or try to have some small project, even if you don't really need them, uh, just to fill up that voice in your CV as well. Yep, so exactly if one needs this, I don't know, a piece of equipment and so on, you encourage to, to try it, to, yeah, that's also to practice writing, no? to, to practice the, to, to yes. follow the process several times and see uh, how it goes and, yeah, yeah. and make it better, essentially. Yes, and also for the big ones, for the big shots, like these big European grants, like you see starting, for example. Uh, to me, I, I tried once uh, to submit a, a project, even, on, even though I knew it was early. Um, and I didn't have a, a clear idea exactly what to do, to be honest. Uh, so I knew possibilities were almost zero and I didn't call it, of course. But it really helped me in writing the second one, who actually was accepted. Because I went through all the procedure, I saw which are the time, the timing, which is the timing, and also well, you know, you talk with people and maybe they, they tell you, okay, I started writing six months in advance, but you are not the other person. So you, you need to know yourself and you know how you react to this condition, how long it takes you to put your ideas down in a clear written way, only if you try once. Mm -hmm. So the, the only advice I have to, to give in this respect, of course, uh, fundings are important, especially if you're going into second science experimentalist, because everything is tremendously expensive, lasers, vacuum uh, components and detectors and so on. So you, you need to, to have fundings to, to perform your research. But even if you have them, uh, because you're working with a, with a professor who, or, or an institution who gives you everything, anyway, do not forget that it might not be the case for, through all your life, I hope so, uh, and the day you don't have this, uh, this uh, condition, then if you have an empty list in your CV, it's a problem. So it is an aspect you have to work on while developing your career. Thanks. Uh, would you like to comment? Oh, well, very little, because I think uh, Alicia has made uh, a very broad and uh, uh, detailed uh, review and uh, Matteo has explained the, the, the importance. Uh, I must say that uh, uh, sure uh, theoreticians uh, uh, are less pressed uh, with uh, uh, the pure money issue. Uh, computing uh, is broadly uh, available and mostly for me, for instance, has always been for free. Uh, um, there is uh, just uh, one thing that uh, uh, I wanted uh, to add because uh, say it was suggested me, but um, by a remark by Matteo, and uh, it applies for funding, but uh, it applies uh, to all applications in a way. Uh, the, the most important application for the young people will be for positions, <laughs> no, because after a while one uh, tries to, to get uh, some semi-permanent, then possibly permanent. Uh, and the message is, uh, start early. Uh, you know you will be turned out, but this is not a shame, it's uh, natural. No, uh, but as Matteo said, you learn a lot. First time will be uh, clumsy, <laughs> no, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, you will get some feedback uh, often, uh, and uh, and by doing, uh, you learn uh, what is important, how to shape it, and so on. Yeah, to that I, I have to say fully agree. And uh, in my experience, for instance, when I was postdoc in in Berkeley. I remember there were some open positions. I was very young. It was for assistant professor. Pre professors, uh, let's say, it was kind of not realistic uh, given my age. 
Uh, but I remember I was working there with uh, Bill McCarthy and Tom Rosinho, and both of them, I remember they encouraged me to apply for training. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is in the line that the Pierre is saying. And it really helps because uh, you have to learn to do a teaching statement. You have to do, learn to do a short proposal, a short summary, and then go to an interview. And even if you don't get it, uh, you learn a lot. And, and I remember they did a couple of interviews in, in USA. Uh, that they would have been far above of my uh, <laughs> actual uh, situation, let's say, or a stage of the career. But mm-hmm. it's true that they, they help a lot to learn. So that I, I fully agree with Piero. I mean, it's really it's really a good exercise. And same thing you, with Matteo, writing projects is... Uh, and you also collect materials, no, Aditya? Because it, it's not that you waste everything. I mean, if you wrote something, it becomes the new basis for what you're going to write next. So it's work that sooner or later you have to do. Yep. So it's yep. not totally time wasted for sure. Yep. And to come back to the point Matteo was mentioning, I think also when you, you write a proposal, you sometimes interact with colleagues to, to deepen the, the topic and so on. And so you, you have a scientific discussion that is beneficial for maybe the next application. Or, uh, so for sure you, you improve the, the proposal in, in this way, even if, uh, I don't know, the first one is, is rejected. So I think, I think the message from most of you is that even if you, th- you think that it w- could be rejected or that you have no chance, it's worth to, to, to do it for the, the experience of doing it. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and one thing I would like to add, I mean, I don't know if this is the proper time in the discussion, but I think I should say something um, addressed to a real problem. And as mm-hmm. I was, and I think I should mention it because it's my experience. Yeah that um, uh, the, 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 the gender uh, inequalities is, is there. And for female scientists, be, be ready, uh, be ready. I mean, you're gonna find it in, in and I is not, I'm saying the, you know, it's not a question of, of opinion, it's a question of, of, of a reality. And this is our reality. This is a paper published uh, last year. Uh, these are, for instance, this is just an example of the contribution of women to science in articles and papers in different areas. We are less, we are a minority. In physics, we are a, a significant minority. And uh, these uh, tables uh, are uh, here presented for, for uh, contributions to publications. Uh, you will be amazed on how m- much smaller is the red color when it comes to funding or to being a principal investigator or, or in projects. And this is a reality that we have. And uh, to the female scientists, I would say, don't give up. That you can do it. Uh, you're going to find some harder situations just because uh, you're a minority in a majority. <laughs> and this is uh, like in any society, uh, it gives you some travels. I'm not going to go into details or particulars, but it's a reality. And to the male young scientists that are there, I just hope that you all are convinced that we should bridge this gap. Because if you know anything about probabilities and statistics, if we are 50% of the population and this is our contribution to science, it is obvious that we are missing a lot of power there, uh, useless. Okay. And this is a point I think uh, I. I should bring and, and I had to bring mm-hmm. uh, from a personal perspective, but from a scientific perspective. I mean, this is the reality. Those are the numbers. We are not doing well. And when it comes to funding or um, promotions or whatever, as a female scientist, you are going to find uh, some little constraints. So. Uh, we have someone from the audience that would like to comment on, the, on this point. So please, Sonia, uh, you can... Uh, Switch on your microphone and camera. Hello. Hi. Um, if I may add a comment, because um, I agree to most of what Alicia said, uh, but I also think that the community, as the scientific community, has done a lot in the last few years to promote female scientists sometimes even too much, if I may say that, in the sense that uh, 
the numbers don't say that. No, well, I don't know. I'm giving let, an opinion. Let me finish. Uh, like 10 years ago, I organized the first FEMEX conference, you know, in quantum chemistry, which was this conference that tried to revert the, the ratio between female and male speakers uh, at um, a conference in quantum chemistry. And in connection with that, we asked uh, a few journals to publish the proceedings. And we were told that no, that was, we would not publish your proceedings um, because it was an uh, inappropriate uh, event. Uh, so in this conference, what we did, we tried to have 70% female speakers and 30% female men to revert the ratio that you typically see. I think already just last week, we have seen a lot of special issues in all possibly disciplines where female contributors uh, were invited to contribute. And, and I mean, sometimes it gets a little bit too much, right? But what I wanted to say was different. What I want to say was, it's important to be there. It's important as a female scientist. And if there is any opportunity that is reserved or uh, flagged, I say to the female young scientist, seize it. I mean, don't start, you know, having uh, second thoughts because you don't want to exploit something that maybe is for a female because I'm not just a, a woman. I always say, you are a qualified woman you haven't made the political decision of having something reserved. If it's there, take it or apply because a man in the same situation would do it. So stop, you know, trying to be better or, uh, or uh, you know, having, oh, I don't want that because I don't want to be told that I'm just, I just got it because I'm a woman. You will still probably be told no matter what for a few decades yet, but you know yourself, you know your quality, your value, so just go for whatever is available. And then I say something to the man, uh, I'm a mother of two boys, and I can say like sometimes I frustrated that nowadays, at least in Denmark, you know, including my universities, universities offering special training in uh, STEM, I mean science, science, to girls and doing nothing for boys. My boys love science and they're not offered anything simply because they're boys. So it's also important not to, to lose the perspective that we should promote young scientists equally, no matter the gender and do things for them, no matter the gender. So if later when you become an influential scientist, uh, try to keep this in mind. I mean, it's not a gender war. What we want to do is to progress science. And, and so we should keep an eye on both genders or third genders, no genders, whatever. Gender is not an issue. The only important issue is to promote science and uh, progress science. So, so let's not have a gender war and but take whatever good opportunity is there for you and forget about whether it has an, you know, a label for under development countries, gender related, minority, whatever, just go for it if it's what you want. That was what I wanted to say. I fully agree. I just simply want to point out that if you have an inequality like this, where 15% of women are publishing versus 85%, definitely you have to do something to bridge the gap. And then but when was the date? Let me finish. Let me finish. If you have a cup like this and you treat everyone equal, it's going to evolve like this. You cannot treat them equal because this is here because for years they were treated unequal. So you have to do something. I am not talking about the specifics. I don't want to enter this discussion right now. This will take hours. I'm not going to say which are the measures you have to, talk, to, to do, but it is obvious that in order to bring up here, you have to do somehow something similar of what happened that bring us to here. If you keep equal, if you keep treating everything equal with no difference, it's gonna grow up like this for obvious reasons. I mean, 
if you keep uh, something that is unbalanced, you treat it as a balance, it will keep unbalanced. And unfortunately, sometimes you have to do something that if you had an equal situation, you wouldn't have to do. It would be perfect. If we come from an equal, from a balance, the best way is to keep the balance, and I agree. But if you don't start there, uh, you have to you have to become unbalanced to get the balance. I mean, I'm not talking about the specifics, but this is a kind of a pretty obvious. I mean, this is well known in sociology for for years. They don't want to do it in many places, but but it's known. I mean, I would ask: is, Does uh, Matteo or Pio have any uh, opinion? Or of course, they have an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, say, in a way, uh, <laughs> I shouldn't talk as a male. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the thing. We now came to the point where we cannot really speak. Some uh, can then uh, bring me, me to court. <laughs> I little mention also that once you become... Of, uh, 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 no, I'm joking, no? Uh, uh, say, my point of view... Uh, is uh, uh, closer to that uh, old Sonia, by the way, although I'm much older than her, uh, we, we shared uh, some tens of years of uh, uh, working uh, in the same place, uh, and uh, I always uh, appreciated uh, uh, Sonia very much. I think uh, she is uh, an excellent scientist and also an excellent uh, uh, person, perhaps. Uh, First comes the person, then the scientist. Uh, say, um, okay, in my, frankly, very limited experience, I, I hardly uh, find uh, um, many instances in which I could say that uh, uh, women uh, uh, that I knew in the field have been, uh, um, say, um, taken uh, back uh, because they were uh, female. The, I know female, even my department, that uh, have been abused but, uh, because they worked uh, with uh, uh, that kind of professor that abuses everybody, you know? um, So, uh, uh, Alicia uh, goes to the numbers, no? <clears throat> but, uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, I wonder if uh, uh, she always felt uh, uh, not uh, uh, well recognized because she was a female. I... Uh, say, from my impression, I would say no, but of course uh, she has uh, uh, to say. Uh, of course, uh, uh, there is this imbalance, uh, but in part uh, because, uh, say, in the old times, uh, essentially, and this is also a carryover no, uh, of uh, uh, historic trends, a female went much less, no? Uh, I'm in chemistry. In chemistry, there are more, um, many more females. In physics, uh, I think uh, significantly less. Uh, in biology, there are uh, more females nowadays <laughs> than males, uh, at least uh, as students. Uh, so... I'm sorry, Piero. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I have to stop you there because... Yes, you know, the studies, for instance, in the... Well, first of all, you asked me openly if I ever felt... Uh, mistreated or whatever. I mean, I have worked with you, of course, I, I personally, one-to-one, -one, I, I never felt that uh, with mm -hmm. you in particular. I mean, but the reality is that I am in many meetings where, first of all, uh, there are 10 guys and one girl, me, or two women. Uh, that already by itself is stressful, you know, because you are a minority in a majority. And, and it's difficult, um, even if you were educated to say, no, we are all equal, you, 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 are, you are the different. I mean, I mean, that by itself is a challenge that, our, our, uh, that a minority has that, 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 that is not anywhere else. As I said, this is not a war male-female, not at all. This is a problem that we all have. All male scientists who have this problem, 
because you are missing part of people that are very brilliant and they are not getting into science for the wrong reasons. And, and I'm not saying it's just a problem of a scientist addressing a, a male scientist addressing a female scientist, not at all. It is a problem also, it's a society problem first. And, and, and second, for instance, if you look at the career paths and there are studies here in the autonomy, I, now I feel bad I don't have here the graphs. You can see in, in the institutions, for instance, in chemistry or in physics, that the number of women doing the, the, the bachelor is, let's say, the, the unequal is like, is like this. These are men, these are women. When it comes to doing the PhD, it goes like this. When it comes to go to postdoc, it goes like this. And when it comes to becoming professors, it goes like this. But the funny thing is that this study has been done over the years where these guys have been measured here, the same people, the same group. So it's not a question of, of years, no, no. It is happening. In the generations, women are lost in the past. Not only that, you will find even funnier the graph in which taking the full professors, you look at percentage of IPs in projects versus percentage of women, uh, female IPs for this group. And these bars should be kind of similar, statistically speaking, and they're like this. So there's a reality we cannot deny. This is happening. This is happening. In my career, I have to face being in rooms with many males and, and you have to speak aloud. I have been, uh, honestly, I have been in meetings where uh, uh, getting my voice is harder than for a man. I have seen male scientists uh, proposing something kind of so-so, that doesn't matter. They can keep going. They can keep talking. I mean, I noticed if a female scientist makes uh, a comment in that regard, there's a tendency, a general tendency. It's not a question of, but not only males, also females, of diminishing quickly. And this is well known. This is well known. It's not a question of male scientists diminishing female scientists. No, it's the whole society by default, since our role is the, the, the full professor is the one who knows. But this is always a male professor what we have in mind. Very few times we have a female professor. So the tendency is when a woman uh, talks, by default, it's like, well, let's see what she's gonna say. Not with everyone, not everywhere. Don't, don't take it wrongly, but I have felt that many times. I have been in many discussions with, with, is everyone doing it? No, no. Most of the people I work with, I don't have this feeling, but a large, the large majority. But in some of them, yes. And I get over a step more often than man. And this happens. And this, this little thing here, this little thing there, having to face the fact that, and, and of course, is what Sonia was saying. This is also a question of a cultural thing. We are taught to be, uh, how to say, more polite, more, I don't know how to say, a woman in science that is strong and, ha and give talks and have visibility, they are very often say, oh, this is a tough woman. I have not heard this of men that are really all over the place and they're even bigger. And, and it, you know, these are these subtleties that may the thing a bit harder. And, and of course they're affecting the numbers. I'm not saying that these subtleties are the responsible, but makes it harder. And that we have a problem that we all have to watch, but all of us. I mean, uh, one thing for instance is like when they say, we are looking for someone for a committee for gender balance and everyone looks to the woman. But why we are 20 here, you can do men, uh, female, uh, female balance. You know numbers, you know statistics, you know problems, you have a brain, you can also do it. Why do I have to take care of a problem just because I am a woman? You as a man, you should be worried also because when you hire someone and you have a bias, a gender bias that you don't even know you have, because probably you are not aware of these small things. I am not aware. I have been learning on my way. Then it's like, okay, I'm gonna try to pay attention because it's true. If, if, if we are 50-50 when we start and we end up like this, clearly there's a, a group of people here that are not so doesn't have so many merits to be there. And there are many people here that had brains that were brilliant, that are left behind. This is not good for anyone. Sorry, Thanks. I got hit it. No problem. I think it's, it's an important I just, uh, ask uh, uh, Alicia, uh, just one thing. Uh, I noticed uh, uh, several uh, um, postdoc presentations by uh, your group, or say Fernando, eh? they were all males. 
Uh, what is the proportion there? And uh, would you say that uh, Fernando keeps uh, uh, women uh, <laughs> behind us? No, but that's exactly the point. Fernando doesn't. But uh, for instance, uh, sometimes when you have an application and you are told, in order to apply, please, uh, we would like to, to you to send your CV and send the solution of this couple of exercises. And I tell you, only you're gonna get only male, male applicants, 100%. Because women don't send their application if they are not 100% sure that it's good. Male, you are taught that you can just fill the application and see what happens. This is what Sonia said, and this is a, a, an educational problem in all societies. So at the end, more males make it. I'm not saying, I mean, in, in Fernando's group, we have had balance. Eh? I mean, we have years that we have been really in the group 50-50. When I was doing my PhD, we were six people, six PhDs, and we were exactly three and three. We have had even moments in which we were more women. I am not saying that when you see an, an unbalance in a number, uh, that you have to say, oh, gender bias problem. No, 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 no. I'm not saying that. Same thing that I say, not all, the problem are not only male scientists versus female scientists. Not at all. This is all, I mean, there are many female scientists that we have this bias because we grew up in this society and we are applying this bias without knowing that we are doing it. I'm not saying that and, and, and I don't try to personalize. I mean, what I'm trying to say is like, when you look at the big picture and you look at these numbers and when you're going through science and you see these little things that it seems that, you know, these small subtleties I explain or I give some examples. I mean, clearly there's a problem that, that we need to address as a, as a whole community. And, and, and this is my question to you. Do you think that we have a, a problems with gender inequality in science? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. You may have a problem that goes uh, to say general education, maybe. Uh, I remember, uh, I don't know if uh, probably has been uh, translated also in other languages. Um, many years ago, I read a very nice little book by a sociologist, an Italian uh, lady. Uh, it was uh, um, uh, side with the girls, no? And uh, she pointed out uh, that, uh, okay, uh, just to take the most stupid things that uh, I remember. A girl is given uh, a, a dolly, no? And uh, a boy is given a gun, no? And all this kind of thing. So uh, say uh, the education uh, was, uh, say, started to divide uh, genders uh, at a very <laughs> early age. So- um, What do you mean? What you mean is that we have a problem in gender balance is just you don't think it's only in science, that the problem comes from a yes, bigger... Yes, yes. Okay, but then if, we if do the women have a problem. do not apply, what can I do? No, I mean... <laughs> encourage them, encourage them, and being sure that they have the role models to apply in the future. You can do things. You can do. That's exactly <laughs> my point. You can do things. You can encourage. Yes. Uh -huh. I don't want to break the discussion, but I would like sorry. to... Sorry. Sorry. Can I just say one, one thing and without bringing back the discussion, I hope. Yeah. I think I, was, I have been lucky in my life because I always have female bosses. So at least I, I saw the shiny side of the mood or I was always on the good side. Because yeah. when, I, when I was doing my PhD, Francesca was, Caligari was actually my, my supervisor. So supervising my work and uh, we were working also with Caterina Bozzi. And then I moved to ETH in the group of Ursi. So I, to you, me, it's a bit difficult to, to, to see fully the, the full picture. I mean, it's also almost impossible because I, I think I've been lucky. I was working in groups where there were a lot of female uh, scientists, very good ones, and no one was even questioning the merit or, or the person and the based three on the people, gender. These specific three people you mentioned, did they ever comment on you if they think there's not a gender problem or they do think? No, 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 of course they do think that there is a gender problem. Yes, I'm not saying this. I'm just, I'm just saying that. Uh, actually, Ursi was, was saying that we were special because we, um, we accepted to work with a female professor. Not everybody would do that. And I, I remember I was quite shocked when she said that because it never, never came to my mind 
that when I have to decide where to go and work with, I have to look at the gender of the person I'm working with. So to me, has never been a problem, not, not even a question. I mean, I want to see if the person is a good person, as, as Piero said before, first, a good scientist second, and that's it. And I hope people will come to this point in the future where there is even not, not to discuss about gender because it doesn't matter. Yeah, I totally agree. Being in a similar situation. <laughs> and I, I must say, I mean, I think it's progressing reasonably well in the sense that, for example, uh, in our group now, the balance is, as Alicia mentioned, almost 50-50. Uh, we, we receive more and more applications from females, and I think it's a, it's a very good uh, um, new, and it's promising. Uh, you, sh you showed also, Alicia, the curve. The, it's, it's, it's rising slowly, and I think we are progressing on, on this topic. There's still a lot of work to do, but um, I, I think it was an, an important point to mention for this uh, for, for this roundtable, as many females who in the in the audience. And uh, yeah, I'd like to thank everyone on the topic, and I would like to to move on the second question, or oh, the third question. Sorry, <laughs> you you want to mention something more, Matteo? No, no, no. Third question. You were right. Not second. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the, the third question is more on the scientific uh, point of view. Um, regarding what, in your opinion, is, uh, is the future of ultra science and technology. So I will start um, with, with Alicia, uh, if you want to provide a couple of perspectives in, in according to, to your point of view. Okay, uh, again, I prepared some slides. I mean, I just wanna take uh, a couple of minutes quickly. Mm -hmm. I mean, when it comes to ultra and the second science, we all think about uh, directly lasers and laser technology. I just would like to mention that uh, I think in, in our future, one of the uh, main points is also coming to detectors that we uh, kind of ignore in our first shot, but uh, everyone working on this, uh, we know this is uh, one of the uh, more important improvements and progressions that we have made in the last decade, going from uh, photo detectors, uh, capabilities uh, to really localize very low float on flux seeker photon detection, not only for not only for the MO, MO area, uh, but also you know this goes into quantum computing. Made. It's it's kind of the basis of having single photon detection, and then uh, when detecting particles, there are these time of flight uh, improvements with these magnetic bottles that are now very high energy resolution, BMIs, cold rings that allow particle incoincidence. Let's say all these progresses are are, are should continue because they give us nowadays the possibility of measuring light and particles with, with an amazing resolution. And, and this is now when it comes, when we combine it with coherent light sources is when we have a, a, an, an amazing capabilities. And of course, the two main um, areas or the main uh, techniques are using higher order uh, generation, high order harmonic generation sources or free electron lasers. And just to point out that uh, in the case of uh, high harmonic generation, since the first pulse in 2001 in Vienna by, by Krauss and company, uh, they have been many, many, many advances. I would like to highlight uh, the uh, many, many words that are now progressing on getting shorter pulses uh, given in different frequencies, uh, making, for, for instance, uh, uh, possible to, to go with frequencies in the water window, that this is, for instance, very important when, when exploring um, organic molecules because uh, that uh, gets rid of the problem of the high absorption of water. I don't know, there, there are many techniques that are evolving. In Europe, we have large facilities and early Alps where they are really now able to generate uh, pulses with uh, high repetition rates. There are many works that uh, uh, are improving kind of the one of the main limitations of higher generation, which uh, in brief, in a nutshell, is going to nonlinear process, to multi-photon processes absorptions. And these are really now many, many works nowadays uh, going into this direction, which uh, will open the way to, to many applications. You have seen many of these applications here during this conference. This is an example shown uh, by one of the speakers uh, on, on really tracking uh, electron state switching through molecules, like how really after uh, electronic excitations, the couple of electronuclear motion uh, go together. And, and we can now really follow in real time these problems. And the goal is really to manipulate. There were other um, problems like exploring uh, chirality also presented uh, in this uh, meeting, and in general, let's say there's a whole field of photochemistry where you have have many uh, speakers 
uh, over the uh, these days, uh, really trying to 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 uh, bridge the gap between what happened at the very early stage of a reaction if, if you hit with a very short pulse and then you you induce electronic transitions uh, that this happened in the other time scale and what happened when nuclear motion then you know the, the nuclei see the, the change in the forces in the potential and they start moving how these are accompanied together even to the large large bond and and I don't want to give more examples than those that you were uh, given these days but uh, let's see, these are new fields that are really out there to explore with a lot of active research on trying to really understand uh, chemical reactivity and chemical pro properties and chem chemical dynamics by exploiting the possibility of really looking at the, at the, at the electron motion at, at, the, at the natural time scales. Another big uh, light source that are uh, free electron lasers, and this is, in my opinion, definitely a field that is exploiting and will explode within the next year. Uh, here we have the list of free electron laser and X uh, free electron laser, so in the X-ray region, much higher, higher energies. They have an uh, amazing brilliance intensity. These are uh, perfect tools for nonlinear to, to access nonlinear processes. There's many uh, work on progress on, on trying to explore uh, processes that even theoretically were predicted or expected to, to happen. Now it's possible to visualize them. Of course, the applications are not only in, in AMOS area. I mean, in AMO area. There are, there are tons of applications of, of free electron lasers in biology and in, in many other areas. But I think this is really an area that can exploit uh, in, in the most near future, just based on, on the amount of, of investments that these facilities imply all over the world. So definitely, this is a growing area. And also, you have some talks uh, that I highlighted here and some posters uh, during this conference where there were some um, experimental and theoretical work uh, on, on exploiting these sources to learn about electron dynamics in these particular cases and molecules. But if you uh, look a bit around on, on recent applications of free electron lasers, uh, you, will, um, you will see the, the, the very different areas that, uh, are, that will be uh, exploited. So I think the, the, there's many room for future in second science. Um, many unknown questions, and, and that's the nice thing. That's why I think there's room for, for research there that could bring very interesting things, not only in gas phase, which most of the examples I gave, but also solid states, which is the way of bringing to, to actual a possible scaling in, in, in industry or, or in real life. Mm. So this is just kind of a plot uh, based on what was shown here. But talking about the uh, solid states, Matteo, would you like to comment on uh, the new avenues for uh, atosecond spectroscopy in, in uh, solid state? Well, for sure, um, there are a lot of, I, I think, at least from an experimental point of view, since I'm an experimentalist, a lot can come from technological development. So if, if, you, if you move towards high frequency repetition rate, then all the photo emission experiment time resolve RPS will become definitely more feasible and there there is a lot that can be done with one kilohertz of that we we did something in Zurich but it's a pain and you don't have the signal to noise and ratio you need if you want to, to look into details so for sure that would be one way to open a new field or new branch for research other thing is uh, going to higher photon energies so that you can access easily the L edges and not only the M ones. Um, and that again comes with the logical development of lasers, but they move together, right? Because if you start to, to use different pump yeah. lasers, then inherently you go in the media yard and then you start to go toward the X-rays. So that could be one possibility for sure, and will be for, for solid state, but also for molecules. Um, and then if I want to be a bit provocative, I, I see <laughs> my, maybe, I can say that maybe the, the future of ultrafast science is green in the sense that uh, I feel nowadays a lot of what is done depends on the disposal of fundings. And if you want to have fundings nowadays, you have to apply in certain fields. And it's easier to get fundings if you, if you say that you, you look into renewable uh, uh, sources or green, right? Then maybe someone will actually find a bridge, a real one or, or just a fake one, I don't know, but start moving towards the fields that are actually where you, where you can get more fundings. Uh, 
or more easily. I don't know if this is good or not, because it means that it's someone that is driving your, your research. Yeah, that there are some trends that push you to develop for yeah, specific topics if you want to research. Yes. So you have to, to mask your research and say that you will actually solve whatever problem of the world, even if it's not true. Yeah. Um, maybe Piero, would you like yeah, to add the... Hey, uh, <coughs> the point raised by Matteo uh, just now uh, is, uh, I would say, unfortunately, <laughs> no? in the sense uh, I, I feel a, a pure academic, just uh, for fun, uh, it happens sometimes that the friends or friends of friends ask me, uh, what do you do? And I try to explain. And uh, the typical final question is, uh, what uh, is uh, that, uh, what can be used to, no? Uh, what's the, and I say, I do that for uh, the glory of mankind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but nowadays uh, it's difficult, uh, uh, say, to sell uh, uh, this point. So the young people uh, should be more aware than uh, uh, I needed to be, because it's uh, something of uh, the, the, say, the last uh, tens of years. Uh, well, um, from the science uh, uh, point, uh, uh, Alicia again has made a, a very good uh, overview of uh, the activity. Um, uh, in the, the experimental uh, no, um, uh, area, and uh, uh, okay, Matteo had added uh, to solid states of which uh, I, I cannot say uh, anything. Uh, well, we have uh, a lot of theoreticians <laughs> also. So uh, I would say that uh, uh, there are uh, very good uh, challenges uh, for uh, theoreticians. So uh, I think uh, it's, uh, it's an area that uh, um, is uh, really worth uh, um, developing, uh, uh, say, a career uh, in. Um, we say over the years uh, there have been many tools uh, that have been uh, developed uh, and we take for granted but uh, typically have been taught for different uh, applications so uh, you don't need just to take and apply but uh, often to modify, to fit to your purpose, to develop uh, uh, special uh, uh, applications. Um, just uh, for instance, uh, for uh, what uh, we, we had, uh, say my personal uh, specific interest would be uh, in uh, doing very uh, accurately the small things. Uh, just to give an example, I like uh, uh, I liked uh, a, a talk on uh, um, say validating surface hopping. Sorry to go to the technical, no? Uh, by comparing with uh, <clears throat> very accurate uh, calculations on uh, uh, benchmark systems that uh, give you then uh, an, a real appreciation uh, uh, of what are the limitations, uh, the improvement needs, the uh, area of validity of uh, another approach. Uh, nowadays, uh, it's common to take a piece here, take a piece here, put something together, then, uh, okay, there will be some agreement, uh, some disagreement. Uh, uh, I think that, uh, say, sound work must, uh, uh, say, put a clear limits uh, uh, on what you are doing and understanding the detail. Then, of course, uh, say, uh, one uh, topic that uh, I, I feel uh, close and uh, very interested is this uh, charge migration 
problems, for instance. Uh, okay, um, detection is uh, in a way uh, one of the most uh, difficult uh, uh, issue now. The say cost spectroscopy look uh, very promising on that. And of course, uh, say uh, treating say aminophenol that uh, was uh, mentioned, no, uh, is uh, is a big issue because uh, you cannot uh, do on that uh, uh, say treat uh, extremely accurately everything. So you have to learn. But uh, this process uh, of learning for me goes always uh, from uh, doing very well. And uh, uh, Fernando Martin made a career <laughs> in a way, and uh, uh, say with uh, a series of uh, really beautiful uh, studies of the hydrogen molecule. No, uh, if uh, in my chemistry department uh, I say, okay, uh, I will do hydrogen molecule. People will say, ah, but hydrogen molecule, you will know everything. No, it's uh, not true. And uh, so there is uh, this ladder of, uh, um, of learning, no? Learning and developing. Okay, so this is uh, my excursus. So, uh, this, uh... Thanks. I, I would ask if there's anyone from the audience that wants to ask a question or on, on the topic or on, on the topics that have been covered uh, during uh, the roundtable, because I see that we are reaching uh, almost the end. So feel free to, to ask uh, questions if you wish. I don't see questions. So if so, I, I, I would like to maybe ask uh, again each of the speakers um, what would be their take home message for uh, young CX uh, researchers before we conclude with the, the round table? So, please, Alicia. Okay, so well, but the wrap up uh, is the, first of all, try to find what you like to do. That's, uh, let's say, the first approach to science or to any career. Try to find topics you're interested, try to be motivated, that's for sure. Once you have that, pursue you, your, your interest. Uh, uh, on trying to really get the criteria for not only funding, but uh, uh, what are the lines you want to work with. Look a bit on the future future lines, but but never uh, never stop to have an eye on what are your interests. What do you like to do? What is uh, I think this is the core theme of everything we talk here today about funding or opportunities or whatever. I think one one core thing is be sure of your well being. Be, be sure of your or that your motivation keeps alive and and keep moving and I think this is really the the, the take home home message that uh, uh, even if we didn't specify I think this is the core of, of everything that when when you keep moving you keep moving in a way that you feel comfortable run away from uh, I don't know from a stressful environments run away from um, uh, places where you, even if you are in your, you are not in your comfort zone, but you feel you are learning, that you are progressing, that you are getting, uh, you are reacting properly, that you are gaining something. If you don't feel this is the case, just uh, run away, take another path. And I would say this is for me the most important things to be inside: commitment, hard work, for sure. Without that, there's nothing to do. But also some parts of joy. I mean, the biggest joy, usually, <laughs> in my opinion, the biggest joy usually come after the hard work, because it's where you really feel proud of saying managed. And that's my message for for young people. I would say. Thank you, thank you, Matteo. Very, 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 very quick. So I would say, do your best, have fun and leave a better place than what you found when you came. And if you do that, you will actually, I think, be happy and uh, always let the other have a good impression of you and do, do really the best you can. Talk with people, that's really important. Don't be, don't be afraid. And um, if you're going for experimental uh, up to second activities, don't let, don't let the laser put you down. It's, it's common that sometimes the laser doesn't work at all. The laser system can have really hard problems, hard time. 
for quite some months, but when it works and when things are running, then you recover everything. Yeah, this is so a payback. I think what you mentioned is an important one that maybe a publication is a final product, but it's in the end a human experience. And we didn't have the, the chance to discuss personal experience, but they are up and down. And for example, I also as an experimentalist, the laser shutdown is often one of these issues. But I think that uh, what keeps people doing this science is that is the rewarding that you, you get when something works and you finally get your results. So yeah. sure. I think as you, everyone says, like what you do and, and go forward. Uh, Piero, would you like to give a... Well, say, <laughs> I'd uh, like to be given perhaps <laughs> from the young people, but uh, what I can add, uh, I, I think I... I can add uh, one specific uh, uh, thing that uh, from my experience uh, with uh, colleagues, also younger colleagues uh, and not so young, um, which is uh, this, uh, uh, it has been said already in part, so be open, don't afraid to ask, to talk, to interact, uh, but also not a, be uh, jealous, uh, suspicious uh, of other people, no? Uh, that hinders uh, <laughs> a lot uh, of uh, possibilities uh, of uh, um, making good relationships uh, and uh, open those uh, uh, collaborations which I find uh, very fruitful. Uh, I, I know of uh, people uh, absolutely bright, but they want to keep everything by themselves because uh, otherwise uh, others will steal. Okay, share your knowledge. You will always get much more uh, in uh, reward. Hmm? Thank you. Then I think uh, I would conclude the round table with this. Uh, I'd like to thank the three speakers for, for their participation. I think it was very, interactive and it was nice to, to discuss in uh, this less formal environment. I hope that the people who attended uh, enjoyed and also uh, got some information useful uh, for them. Um, and as a final step, I would give the, the parallel to my colleague Juan Omist, who will uh, perform the, the concluding re uh, remarks for, for the meeting. Thank you, Vincent. Thanks again to Thank all everybody. Bye, thanks. Please one. Uh, yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Well, I think I don't know if you can see me actually. Um, no, I don't think you can see me, right? Um, no, you can. See. Okay. So, hi everyone. So this is the very last talk, as you may guess. So with this. Final remarks. We want to summarize what we have done and well, all the expected, but with all our expectations, that actually has been very fulfilled. And I will just want to share with you, first of all, about the participants. These are the statistics for the country of the institutions they belong to. By far, Germany wins with 17% uh, 17 17 then the United States with 11% and Spain, Spain at least bronze medal in this uh, contest with 10%. Uh, we had 158 participants from 32 countries. That's quite a lot. And what is most impressive is that they come from Canada to Japan worldwide. So, let me take this opportunity to thank all of them for the effort to give talks and take part of this event in this, uh, well, in the European time zone, let's say. Actually, for us was a very satisfying surprise that we got so many participants and from so many countries. We have 36 talks and 25 poster presentations. That was also Quite a lot and we really thank you all for this they were um, all of them very interesting and they will be available online unless you have told us not to 
as an online in the YouTube channel of, um, of the post section. So please, if you have not told us and you don't want your, your talk to be online, please contact us. This will be done soon, uh, but the sooner you do it, the sooner we take this into account. And we had a big attendance of 69 attendance on, on a talk. This was on Tuesday morning and an average of attendance of 50 over the three days. So this is actually also a lot because of course they were not always the same people. So this is good because people just were moving depending on their interests. Also regarding the position, we are also very happy that almost half of the participants are PhD students and around 32% are early career investigators, that's it. Postdocs, that's also good, and 20% seniors. This also makes this very interesting because actually it covers the, the aims we had at the very beginning of this event. That was give, giving, to give the opportunity to the PhD and master's students to share what they are doing to practice on the speakings because some of them are about to defend their thesis. So this is a nice way to practice. And also to contact these young researchers with senior researchers that are really working on something that is at the edge of the field and they can of course benefit of. Uh, regarding the gender, this is something that was also uh, well, very um, interesting in the round table you already had. Uh, we have a uh, 70% of male participating and 28% of female uh, participants. This is something that, of course, we want to uh, go to 50-50. But of course, regarding uh, the statistics that Alicia showed, well, it's around the statistics in the field. So, well, what can we do? Let's cross finger and hope that in the next years, this situation will change. So I, I don't want to finish this without thanking, uh, without um, giving and saying thank you to all the people that has made this possible. First, to all uh, my colleagues in the Alliance Committee, Gabriele, Tomislav, Torsha, and Vincent. Of course, I want to highlight the role of Gabriele, who was the local organizer, because uh, for you that don't know, uh, this event is organized in Milan in Italy, and she, he has taken care. He has taken care of everything regarding bureaucracy and budget and funding. And so uh, we all, I, I know, I can talk uh, in the name of all the organizers. We really want to uh, thank Gabriele his effort. I, I would also like to to thank, of course, the Atokem Cross Action because all this is organized within this action. Um, in particular to Eva and to Beatrice, because they have, of course, helped us a lot. Um, and you all know that we are in this team, we are PhD and early careers investigators. And I think none of us has experience on this. And they have uh, given, up, given us lots of support. And um, of course, we, we thank her a lot uh, for their help. Uh, well, also, I would like to thank Fernando and Laura Cataneo uh, because of uh, her participation also with the opening speech by Fernando Martin and also Laura for her role on, on chairing and helping us to manage the sessions. Of course, I would like to thank Giorgio and Davide from the company Smart Eventi for their technical support. Everything was smooth and pretty easy. So um, if you are there, Thanks a lot also with the registration procedure. I, I've been told by, by several of the participants that the uh, registration process was very easy, very straight. So I, have, I was very happy to hear that and I would like to share with you. So in case you want to organize anything, please contact <laughs> Smart Eventy or ask Gabriele because they really were fine and were very thankful. Of course, I don't want to forget all of you, all the participants, uh, because of your attendance and your contributions. All of them were very interesting, very interesting. And of course, this was devoted for you. And uh, before we finish, I would like to 
tell you that we will send you a form with some questions just about the performance of the symposium and to know your opinion about what did you like the most, why, what didn't you like, what you didn't like, what could we have done to improve. And also, and it's a point that I didn't highlight here, uh, this was the first young scientist, scientist symposium within the Atukem Coast Action. And I think that was a very nice experience, not only, I guess, for the participants, but also for the organizers. This has helped us to know how to deal with bureaucracy, with organization, with all this in these tough times of the COVID. Of course, this is also, I think, a plus. And I encourage you, all the people that has interest on organizing to contact the responsible of, of the main of the post action or to contact us. If you are interested in organizing, why not the second edition? I think that's something that the post action is interested in and uh, it will be, I think, great for everyone. Uh, finally, please contact us in case you want to request an attendance certificate or a poster or a presentation certificate. Please send an email to this address and we will handle this. And well, uh, that's it from my side. I don't know if you have any question regarding this, any comment? I cannot see if you... Okay, no rising hands. Okay, great. And finally, what's a conference without, without a good picture? So I, I, I encourage you, please, to open your videos so we can take some screenshots and then we have a nice picture to take us home, to take home. Some, we are just 20 people. Okay, but well, at least I don't have to slide the <laughs> screen. So there, there are kind of nine. Thank you all, of course, again, for uh, taking part of the very last session. This is tough in a, some conferences that are live, but of course, online is even more, <laughs> I would say. Okay, just, okay, well, maybe the rest of the people has any issue. Okay, we will take a picture and then we can do some Photoshop. <laughs> okay, say cheese. Okay, that's it. Well, thanks a lot for everything and hope you, to see you in the next <laughs> event that hopefully is organized by some other participants. I don't know if my any of my colleagues want to say something. I may have forgotten something. <laughs> Everything is good in my opinion. Thank you, all. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. So thank you all and see you in the next conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you to you. Ciao. Ciao. Ciao.